So we ready? We're ready. All right, guys. Welcome back to the Raised Hunting Podcast. And today I'm joined again by Warren and Easton. And all of us have now punched a tag. So mm-hmm. we are 2023 bow season in Iowa is closed. It's now officially gun season. However, our late season stuff starts again when you can use a muzzleloader or a bow. So, but anyhow, we're going to review some of that. Talk a little bit. Easton's got his deer here for us to enjoy. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But before we get going too far, we have to make, we've asked for you guys to help us out and make sure you're doing reviews. And you guys went full bore. Warren has some stats that, um, uh, I, the one that stands out is the growth of our podcast in 2023 was over 500%. Woo woo! Yeah, big hands up, hands together, clapping for you guys, not for us, because you guys are what have made that happen. So, appreciate you guys. But if you have some other stuff you wanted to share, well, Spotify, those guys just flat kick ass because we went over two hundred reviews on Spotify, which it was not that long ago. We were asking to break a hundred, yeah, and we went over two hundred. So um, I really wish that it would give us their names on there so that we could give them some love. But then on uh, Apple, you guys, you guys are still doing pretty good, but you, the Spotify guys are kind of kicking your butt, especially when some of the Spotify guys come over to Apple and leave reviews just for just to help us out. Which maybe maybe Apple, it, I think maybe it's this is actually Apple's fault, not our fault. I don't think very many people really listen to podcasts on Apple. It's a whole maybe separate don't. app. Yeah, I've music. never listened to them on Apple, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, I Only have some, Spotify. It's Spotify, is, that's one thing I do like Spotify more for. But anyways, we got a shout out to Bo X. He says, love the podcast. I'm from VT. That's Vermont, right? That is correct. Good <laughs> job. Proud Can, of you. I, don't, I was no, mixing Virginia. up with Virginia for Virginia. some reason. Virginia oh, Tech. My. Isn't that, that's why, because the football team. Virginia Tech. Yes. Yes, that's exactly why. And I've had the opportunity to hunt out that way, and I've learned a lot about hunting in the Midwest from you guys. In New England, it's way different hunting. Keep up the good work with the baits and the topics. And then Nick Knott, as always, is is representing. Appreciate you, buddy. So uh, keep leaving those reviews. We really appreciate them. We've had five, well, not five. We've had 14 different countries listen to the podcast this year. The top five was America, Canada, Australia, United Kingdom, and Mexico. So I'm gonna wor- I'm gonna learn some Spanish. Yeah, I want to see when like, I want to see how they do that, where they put in you know Spanish speaking person for you. I already have the Aussie saying. down. I'd love to see that down. Kangaroo Jack, eh? <laughs> whatever. We're going to go to Andy. The Aussie, I don't know. Kangaroo. If you guys did get your wrapped back in our podcast is like back your number one. What? number one or like your number five or something do us a favor and i will come up with something for you guys and tag us on social media and with your screenshot or your share of whatever the raised hunting podcast is for your wrapped and tag raised hunting i promise i'll take care of you for something i don't know what yet but yeah the other thing we i don't know we're talking about doing too I know you'd be on this, so but we need to know from you guys so we know it's even worth our time or not. If we found some way to be able to be flexible and let you guys call in at certain times and discuss some of these topics, would you do that? And uh, let us know by either just responding on the Spotify thing in the the one that we still don't know how to answer to, but <laughs> respond on there or let us know on Instagram or whatever because um, I think that could be kind of a fun way to get some different opinions too on some of our topics so yeah just some interaction yeah yeah so let us know we'd like to hear from you all right let's talk a little bit before we get into kind of our question and answer type stuff what do you got here easton oh we're doing it that order huh all right well it's kind of the high the topic here is easton finally kills a deer yeah no (laughs) kidding it's not like it was not lack of trying i can tell you that much uh, confirmed. I have one very besides killing a freaking stud. I have one good positive that came out of all this, and I hate it, but I like it. I got the nickname. I got the nickname Mister Deer Sember from Warren. <laughs> <laughs> this is the third deer I have shot 
In December during the early split. So for Iowa, typically it's right around that first like couple days of December is when we'll uh, go into shotgun season. And December 3rd, I think, is the latest I've ever, I, we've ever had it go into December. And I've killed a buck on December 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. So the fact that I've killed deer in December during the early split versus the late split, which is like somewhere between like the third week of December and on, is quite uh So has it been the day before the end of the season then? Every time? Uh, every time except times? for one. That, the, the one that I killed on December 2nd was... Uh, Two days before. Well, last was year's deer weird? was still late. Last year was November twenty sixth. I don't know, man. That's really early. That's yeah. That's <laughs> four days before <laughs> December. I didn't. I genuinely didn't think going into this year that I would or ever. I figured it might be possible, but I didn't think that there would be much of a way that I could hunt more than I did last year, as far as like days and sits. And I blew it out of the water this year, not intentionally. That was not a goal of the year. And I think last year was somewhere around 35 uh, days of actual hunting, somewhere in there. Ended up being 63 sits. This year was 44 freaking days. And I haven't even looked at how many sits because that's scary. So, it's but, a lot. Um, I guess about him. S- well, hold on. So, a whole I a think lot. a lot of people are probably wondering – so did you pass up a lot of deer? Is it that type of thing that you were holding off? What is what is it? Is it that you know in the in your, are you holding in your back pocket? Late season's coming, and I kind of have that down pat now. So, um, or is it? It just didn't go work out. I mean, how do you uh, answer that? A little above. Well, first off, it's not like I was passing deer left and right this year. Yes, I had a goal. I I wanted to shoot my one of my big goals and. He, he accomplished one of my just baseline goals, but at the same time, uh, one of my big ones is I want to be able to pick a deer out, not necessarily just one, but like a deer that I've had history with or I know about or we've tracked for years or this, that, and the other, and be able to go out and shoot one. Um, both of you guys have done it multiple times. I've never done it, and this is the second year of attempting to do it, and I'm getting my freaking butt kicked, and it's proving that uh, going to shoot a certain size deer or going to shoot a certain caliber deer is a totally different story or a totally different uh, methodology, challenge and method than, than going to shoot a specific deer. And even even though I had different places that I had one or two or three bucks that I would, I would shoot and I had history with or whatever, I had options, but at the same time, when I was, say, on this piece of ground, I have two bucks two bucks that I'm waiting for uh, out of however many deer are there. So your chances are tough in the first place. Secondly, you're trying to get one of those two deer to not only be seen but come in within bow range. And so to answer your question, no, I wasn't passing uh, passing deer. I think the biggest deer I may have passed this year um, may have been 140-something which I know sounds crazy to some people, but... Um, in Iowa, that can with, be a three-year-old pretty, pretty I've, commonly. I've, I've off, I have had years where I have had multiple 140s um, that I... Not necessarily... Like some that I had passed, some that just... I had at least seen a lot. Um, a lot of that caliber deer and some larger. This year, I could probably count on one hand. Out of 44 days of hunting, I could probably count on one hand how many deer I saw over 140. And I, uh, I don't know, you could blame that on me as a hunter. You could blame that on a lot of things from what I have experienced. Not that I've changed a whole heck of a lot from the years past is it just doesn't seem like they're there. There are, there's that many of our big boys. I think Um, we need to preface for people really quick because especially since we realize that we've 83% 83% of people listening to this now are, are technically somewhat new, right. uh, to the race family. Everybody, I guess m- a lot of our podcast listeners probably don't cause they've heard us talk about it enough now, but a lot of people traditionally thought that all we, that we owned hundreds of acres to thousands of acres and that everything we had was locked up and, 
uh, super secure and, and food plots and everything else. And honestly, I'd say we're quite a bit different than most of the other guys, you know, juries and stuff. They're in a, they're hunting an entirely different way that we are. We don't have anywhere near that much ground or, um, or the same level of food plots or anything like that. We're hunting deer a lot more how those deer want to operate instead of manipulating them, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And I think that it's important for you to preface that where you were, the specific place that you were hunting for the first till November 5th or something around there is a place that is permission ground and it's kind of like public ground. (laughs) There's a lot of people there. It's a hit or miss on the year. Yeah. I've hunted it for a long time and sometimes it's crazy because there's not very many people there. I don't run into anybody. We've gone years where we haven't seen Mary, like maybe one or two other guys. And then there's years where... Not this year. Where, yeah, I can't avoid it. Um, and that was that was tough. It didn't bother me. Um, no, but I think that you have to. to take into consideration is is there is somewhat of a difference. If you're trying to kill a, a specific deer, and then you, and you're now you're going to go to somewhere where somebody can walk through at any time and do whatever... It's going to make it just like if you're trying to kill a, a target deer on public. If I was going to go public land hunting, I'm at least me personally for till I killed quite a few of them. I'm not really trying to kill a specific deer. I'm yeah. going to try to kill a deer of around a certain caliber, and because I can't control that many factors. And so I think in, if you really look back at your season, you in the time that you transitioned and were open to hunting some other places was probably the worst time that you could have to then be chasing a, a particular buck. Yeah. Because it was already well into the rut where does were in heat and, and who knew and it, there was no pattern left. Like this year, I wasn't necessarily, uh, I had two or three different deer that I had, I had known for multiple years that I've even uh, found antlers to and stuff. And again, like on a permission piece that a lot of other people shed hunt and stuff too. So it's pretty cool that I've had experiences with a lot of them. Um that I wanted to chase and in my, I, I wasn't necessarily against, uh, hunting other place. Like last year I'd say, yeah, I was, I was stubborn. I was like, I'm want to hunt this one spot for this one deer. That's how it's going to go. And this year was more so of, I knew the experience I had had last year with getting some of these bucks close on that specific place that I wasn't against it as much as I was trying to make myself focus. I was trying. I, I I feel very uh, spread out. I think when I bounce to different places, if I have the ability to, um, because I feel like I'm scatterbrained. I'm, in my head, I'm a very organized person, and when I'm going to different spots, I have to try to get my mindset into the spot of okay, ignore everything else we're just doing. I got to focus on what this spot is, how these deer operate, and how this one does, and then tomorrow it might be different. And uh, so to me, sometimes like this this year, we're like that first month was trying to focus, was trying to say, hey, you know these deer, stick to it, do what you know is there, and trust my gut. And it just wasn't, it was not in the cards. Like like we said, the amount of people that were hunting there this year were just, uh, it's not about the fact that there's people hunting there as much as it is like w- if I'm not there or if I don't know what's going on, um, it's very tough to be able to predict what what the deer could or would be doing because I don't know if somebody was in there yesterday when I wasn't or or what has been in there the for the week that I thought that it wasn't being pressured and things like that so it just makes it tough um so that was part of it but that I guess my point to all that and you got me off topic but was trying to kill that one deer or a deer is props to props to the people that that do it consistently um, <clears throat> and I don't know very many people that do really do it consistently. What are you doing, Christo? That's a good dog. He, he likes deer. Uh, just because I, th- again, hunting a caliber is 10 times different than hunting a, uh, I would almost make deer. an argument to that though. Cause I've thought about that before. If I just said it, I want to kill 150 inch deer unless I, w- and, and this is going to pertain to wherever you live and what is. The caliber of deer there. It could be a 100-inch deer. Unless I went down to like a 140-inch deer, I almost think it might be more difficult to just go kill a 140-inch deer or bigger, or not a 140-inch deer, say 150-inch deer or 160-inch deer. 150-inch deer or bigger 
than one particular deer. Why do you say that? Because <clears throat> when I'm chasing one particular deer, and, and specifically at the times that I'm trying to move in on him, I have drastically increased my odds because I know what that deer is doing, opposed to just knowing that, hey, there's five or six here, but I still have to get that one you're of those five or six to within to within shooting distance and to do it at a time that I'm able to make the shot. Um, you're just taking everything that you feel as though you can control and putting it into one. Yeah. Versus things you can't control for five or six. I, w- I would say a few things have changed that somewhat, though, like the, your rub trees. Like our rub trees where we know we got multiple bucks coming to it, that'd be different. But yeah. well, if I'm just in a timber or something and, uh, you know, in a stand – if I'm just setting up in the timber, I, I mean it. I think you're way better off trying to know a particular deer and that some of his habits before you go just randomly throwing up a stand. I mean, obviously, we're never randomly throwing one up. But my point is, if you're just in open timber and you're trying to get somewhere where they really like one deer in particular, um, may not be that much different. Yeah. Um, so what are I mean, and I know we were going to talk about this in a minute. I think. What are some of the things that we've learned? You've already kind of talked a little bit about what you're referring to, I guess, as far as whether you're hunting a particular deer or a particular particular size deer. Um, because I guess I look at it, and one of the things you talk about the rub trees, I'm going to, I don't want to say that I'm going to rely on them even more, but I'm going to make sure that I strategically locate them even better because they are that powerful. Yeah, yeah. I've, <clears throat> I've they're, they're decided flat. like next year for the rub trees that uh, like I've already put them in a spot that I know I could get a stand into or um, I like to mix a spot that I can get a stand into as well as it's obvious, like visually obvious for the deer and where they're at, obviously. Um, and I think next year I might try some where it's like, okay, I know this stand is in a good spot and I'm going to put a rub tree in front of it, whether it's super visual or not, because... Uh, I feel as though sometimes I'm restraining myself. Like, I want it to be visual. I want it to be in a spot where they're crossing and get a stand in there. And then I'm trying to force wins on where that is. Um, and I want to see if you could just get them more consistently through your good spots. And then the other one that about the rub trees that I would say, because we got a number of people that ask us about what t- type of tree, how big, how what what is the um, – what uh, – what am I trying to say? What is the, what's the word for the type of tree? There's another better word. Species. For species. What's the species of tree that we're using? And, and the white pine still ranks number one for us. Our white pines this year were not as big as what they have been in the past. And we had a lot of issues with these deer breaking the trees this year. I, I 100% disagree with you. Well, how? It they, is because, they're because laying on the it's ground. When we, we cut them. They've been down for freaking yeah, like but six months. But if they weren't as big, they weren't going to be whittling it down so far. I had smaller ones last year that bigger. weren't breaking at all, but they were fresh cut. It, no, but they were also so small that it was like a cat toy. What's it, they're still hitting it though? It doesn't matter. It's flexing. That's, yeah, but that's I think that if you have or you just go with a bigger one, it's not going to break like that. That's what I did this year, and they all snapped. Well, you need to go bigger then. No, I went like three. Okay, so we need to cut them you fresher. Need to cut them fresh. That cut is them the bigger key. and put them in locations that you know you want to shoot from. And, and rely on those trees because they flat work. They do. The thing I think that I never realized would be so powerful with them is I think that especially up till November 1st, November 2nd, they add a whole other element to calling. Absolutely. It seems as though you can rattle at a deer, you can grunt at a deer, you can snort wheeze at him, and if he comes over and he was going to do the hang-up deal, you know, where he's 60 yards away or 70 yards and he's just looking for that deer and he doesn't see him, uh, it seems like, Opposed to if there is a rub tree there, he will at least say, well, I'm going to go hit this rub tree, and in case somebody is over there somewhere, I'm just going to let him know I'm the boss. Right. And I think that is unbelievably powerful to it, it, – because your only other option with that before would be a decoy. And I hate decoys just for the fact that – I know Shane would argue with me, but I just hate the fact that your does freak freak out with them, and it just drives me nuts, so – I think that's a super, super powerful thing to be able to utilize to have call and have one that will come and commit to it. So what was some – so what that, that was what we were going to talk about is some of the key things we learned this year we're going to pay more attention to. So I think I, Easton has a great one. I think he should start with that one because it's earlier in the season. Okay. That, um, 
it's kind of specific, but uh, hunting, I, I had paid more, did not pers- intentionally pay attention to it. It just happened, and I connected the dots. Uh, hunting water during the rut could be much more beneficial than I've given it credit for in the past. And the only thing I would say with that is I think no matter what the temperatures are, they're going to need water, obviously, uh, to survive. It's just I think that, like, especially for us this year, we had quite a bit warmer days even if it was like 40s or 50s, um, and when they're running and rutting as hard as they were, I had a day or two there where I was sitting next to a pond not because of the water, because of the the funnel that was going to drive them by me, and every one of those deer, I was expecting them to be like walking back and forth or like checking uh, the timber that I was facing and everything, and just about every one of the deer, and we saw like 15 or 20 different deer, came down like I thought they would, somewhere in the general area at least, and then all went down to the water. All went down to the water, they'd be gone for 10 or 15 minutes, and then they'd come back up, and then they'd be doing their thing again. And some of them would even go get water, and then come back up and bed down right there in their bedding area. And so I just started paying more attention to the fact that, okay, we had warm weather, they're rutting, and there's a good bedding area. So those three things that were pushed together extremely well is like that one was natural, a natural pond in a natural bedding area. Having a pond that was secluded and because it's in the trees and everything where they still can feel safe with mixed with their bedding or good bedding area within 50 to 100 yards of where that is was a great, great uh, like mixing point for all these different deer that were coming around, does, bucks, all of them, to get water, they were bedding, bucks checking does, like, it was like a hangout that they didn't even intentionally go to, because they knew that they needed that, they know they want to be by bedding, and the bucks want does, it, it was uh, kind of a light bulb when that, when I started it's, seeing it's, that. It honestly is kind of like bait, baiting, only it's legal. Yeah. I mean, it's that powerful, or it and can I, be that powerful. I, I, I agree with you 100%. Too. It, I it is. Think. I think some areas, there's plenty of water. I think there's plenty of water in some places, and I, the reason I am so strong on thinking that the bedding area had a big factor in it with how close it was and how secluded it was is because that specific place had uh, it had the bedding and everything and then a big pond that is nothing around it really, and then there's another pond that is on the other side that's more out in the open, like right by the beans and everything, and... They, they don't hang out by it. I mean, they'll go by it and everything, and they tend to go by it quite a bit. But it's not like they were hanging out and chasing around and checking like they were down in the trees in the secluded area. That so would I, be the only thing I'd be thinking about is I'd love to put a few in a bedding area. But my question would be, uh, what about when we're, like, in a drought like this? It's hard you to know, get water, so, too. Yeah, you're yeah, going to have a hard time, especially, too, if it's not somewhere I really want to be going into. Right. Because I do think if you can have it in the right it, the right spots, I mean, that's going to be super powerful. Uh, because what I'm trying to think of here to be able to help out a lot of our listeners is I think that, because I know Pat uh, from Driven does them a lot too. And so we got to give him a little credit because it seems like he's really figured that out. But the one thing I think that we can talk about that's a little different for most people is what I think more and more we're realizing is from a lot of the guys that you're seeing on TV where they're able to put them on food plots or put them on field edges all the time. We're Putting also, water. yeah. Yeah. Like um, the little, like making your little pond thingy. I, well, I think to get to what I, what we're d- d- t- talking about, what we've really learned, I think a lot of this is coming down to that. I think a lot of people are going to be relate, able to relate to is that we are able to see our deer and we're able to find the ones that we're after. However, getting them to 40 yards or under, and giving us a shot is our biggest challenge, I would say, at this point. Um, and so I think that comes down to, okay, well, how do, what are some things that we can do to mitigate that? A lot of the other folks that you see, and obviously nothing against them because we try to do that too, but they're putting in food plots, they're putting in the perfect access, they're taking bulldozers and doing all kinds of stuff to be able to change the routes of things to where they can make those deer do what they need to. If they see him, there's a great chance he's in the food plot, he's chasing a doe. At some point, he's got to come through the pinch point or whatever, and they kill him, right? Some of our stuff, we don't have that ability to do that. A lot of it, of it honestly. <laughs> and so I think that the water would be a way that everybody else could do too where you can be putting that near a bedding area and when they're running does and they're doing those things that they're comfortable enough to come and that gives them a reason 
gives them something, just like the rub trees, to put them at at the distance that you need to actually kill them. But because that, I, that's the only thing possibly that I can think of right now that will make Warren grab a shovel in the summer and start digging a <laughs> hole. But I gotta f- keep find a way to keep that thing full because I'm not digging that damn hole if it's not gonna stay full for the whole, yeah. whole season. Well, they make different size ones, and and where this became. We could do it with Yeah, this. this is actually your idea. Yeah, well, I mean, I Thanks have a couple. Thanks for giving it away, Dad. I have a couple of them out there that we're, we've utilized, and then, but I had a deer actually go into one of them that was dry and was pawing at it. And I was like, what is that noise? And then I realized he's over there trying to get a drink, and there's no water in it, you know? And so I'm like, all right, we need to be keeping these because we were in a drought. I mean, typically, we'll get enough rain that there'll be water in it. Right. You know, but this year we just did not have enough. Yep. Um, but they make different size ones. I mean, we're not using a kiddie pool. The ones that we use are the, I think they're earth blind is the guy that um, yeah. that makes them. Um, I'm and, being totally honest. Well, in the kiddie pool. Were, any of you guys, because this is what I'm going to do next year. Go, what, uh, go, what, go get the uh, the water lining. Why am I blanking on plastic? It? Yeah, mm-hmm. just like the black plastic Rubber. they use. For sh- I used it for construction all the time, but you could you get big rolls of it. Mm-hmm. I go buy a roll of that, and I'll take a shovel and take that, and I'm gonna go put a pond wherever I want it, whatever size I want it, and I don't have to go buy that thing or how it, try try to carry it into some of these places. <laughs> Didn't we I'd try a kiddie pool? Into. We, no, we used one for antelope years ago. You sh- I thought we used a kiddie pool before too for deer. At your house, it didn't work. No, no, I've done only I for, did antelope. It for antelope. I knew the antelope wouldn't drink out of it. Yeah, they goofy didn't, bastards. They didn't like it. Yeah, yeah, yet they'll drink out of water troughs. Yeah, yeah. they didn't like the goldfish on the bottom or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. Okay, know. so was that your only one? Uh, that one, and then I just came up with. Uh, it's kind of hard because I didn't necessarily learn it. I'm I'm paying more attention to it. Would be reading land, um, for funnels. I know that we talk about them. I know that I hunt funnels, uh, but putting a lot more weight. And what I mean by this is like something that I learned this year that me and you hunted a completely different spot that for five years I never touched um, because I went on my Onyx and I was like, you know what, let's try looking at the topo, just just the topo, not any of the trees or nothing. And I could really just see uh, where certain things came together and, um, that you wouldn't see with trees, you wouldn't even see on the ground. And so I wanted to try that the one night because I said, okay, there's all these areas in here where I've got a funnel over here, a funnel over here because I have physically seen them or they do somewhat uh, funnel them down. But this spot I haven't hunted them. I can't find these deer right now. And this spot right here is the only place it looks like on a topographic map that literally brings different things together that you wouldn't pay attention to just by looking at the land. And me and him went in there and not that we had a crazy sit, we saw five, six different deer compared to the one that I might see it a long ways away uh, in that on that same exact piece for the past couple of days that I was struggling with. But I went right there, and immediately you could tell that there's travel patterns through it extremely well. So I've learned to trust funnels, obviously, but trusting, like, look, look at a topo map just to see um, if you can find a little pattern of something or where things come together because it's a hidden natural uh, funnel that you may it may not be recognizable just by looking at it. That's cool. I think food food is food is something that we have, we know we plant our own food plots. We live in Iowa. We have cornfields and bean fields that are close to us and things like that. But I'm going to. I'm going to really pay attention more on what these deer, I paid more attention this year, kind of like stockpiling my information for next year. And, and that goes along with another tip that I would tell you that I believe that last year can help you more to kill your deer this year. Mm-hmm. Going back and, and looking at, I mean, if you can start to figure out BG would be a perfect example. Yep. Just hang on. He should show up. He should show up. You know, just hang on. And sure enough, boom, he was a little bit late, but he showed up. Yep. Um, and he kind of was doing the same thing that he did last year. He was in their same area. So there's things that by having trail cameras out that you can learn. Now, you can if you employ cellular cameras, you can learn some of that on the fly during the season. 
Yep. You know, but if you're not going to use cellular cameras, then you're really stockpiling information for next year, praying that the deer, if you're not hunting public land, or even if you are, that public land, it's probably even more prevalent because typically the same kind of thing is going to happen. There's usually a parking area and places where people enter and exit, um, but the pressure can change. So one of the things that I was noticing was that some of these deer, I started really paying attention to temperature um, uh, fronts and things like that coming in on when they were going to clover, when they were going to alfalfa, when they were going to bean fields and corn fields. And, um, and you guys were doing the same thing. You would, you know, you're driving, you'd already killed your deer and you're like, Oh, they're all over the beans today. Yeah. You know, noting what is the, what is the temperature? What is going on here? Why are they, why is one day the bean field full, but then a day later there's four deer in the bean field and they're all over in the corn field. Well, those deer are telling you something. They're telling you that their bodies are telling them that they need to, they need a certain nutrient, and that's what they're after. So if you can plant food plots, and we can, I'm going to adjust some of our food plots to accommodate earlier season stuff. Um, and one of the things that I noticed is the deer were walking through my turnips and stuff like that in early October to get to my any, any little bit of clover I had left. It, they were all over the clover. I think that's a really good one. I think that, uh, I think that's, there's a lot of value in that just because if you are missing your deer, that may be all it is. It may be just that it, he's missing a little bit, yep, he's going to this food or he's going to that food. Um, okay. Did you have another one? Well, there's more. So to go into a little more depth on that as far as what type, and, and again, I'm, a, I'm a big, um, I'm a big fan of brassicas. I'm a big fan of late season um, having turnips and radishes and things like that. And so having those planted for the late season, nothing we can do about the fact that we're just not getting the moisture to really get a booming food plot. Hopefully that will change in the next com- couple of years. I also feel like, though, when we first started using brassicas a lot, we would, we would get those really cold uh, ruts on occasion and when that was the case that's when brassicas has become good mm-hmm. for the, for them absolutely change taste a little bit and i feel like we don't i think everybody in the world is dealing with different weather changes but i think that right now we've noticed it's pretty consistent that we're not going to have super cold cold ruts in in recent years um so brassicas for bow hunting for us are great maybe later in November. Later in November, yep. Um, but they're not necessarily benefiting as us as much as they were 10 years ago when we were having really cold times all the time, and they were coming out into it all the time. Right. We're clo- That's just something I've thought of. But Clover, alfalfa, seem, and I, and I kind of mix clover and alfalfa together. It seems like when they're after one, that yeah. either one will, will suffice, something really soft and green. Yeah. You know, um but man, and so I'll, I mean, and then the location of my food plots, really pay attention to how you're going to get in and get out of your locations. If you're going to put a food plot in, don't put a food plot in with your tree stand perfectly set for a northwest wind, but you got to walk in right through the food plot to get to that location. Yeah. Um, or w- think about that prior to setting your food plot up. Absolutely. Set your food plot up so that there's multiple access points or you plant certain things that are going to cover you to get in certain ways uh, or, I mean, all kinds of things to think before you go putting something in. Then you're stuck with that and trying to figure out, okay, I can hunt it with this wind, this wind, and this wind, but yet I can't get to it. Right. You can you can fix that by how you set it up sometimes. So what's the smallest food plot you would do that you think is worth? Because I think this is significant. I, you know, I'm trying to think the smallest one we have is probably a quarter of an acre. And I, and I guess it all depends on how you lay it out. If it's long, you know, then it can be narrower. Like I have one that's fairly long and the farthest is across it is like 35 yards, you know, um, where if it's a square or a rectangle, I love the one that we have that's an hourglass. Yeah. You know, that it's big on one end, big on the other end, and then there's a funnel in the middle. That one's not a quarter acre, though. No, that's almost three, two yeah. and a half acres. It's pretty big. Yeah. Um, but he's asking how big is the smallest one, and I would say probably a quarter of an acre or, or less. I mean, there are times when you could plant something, especially if you're looking. I think one of the things that's missed is 
giving these deer kind of like the water in the bedding area, if you can give them a place where they can get to a certain food that they can graze on or whatever before they go out into a cornfield or a big bean field or something like that, you can catch those deer in, in kind of a pre, you know, a, a, a pre-feed yeah. area. <clears throat> you know, you're not in like a staging area, I guess, but it's a food staging area. I think personally that that, I think anything less than an acre is a waste of time. Because in my opinion, it seems like any of the ones that we've planted that are like a quarter acre like that, sure, it, they may they may hit it, but I think those deer were going through there anyways. It's that's not a, a big enough it's not a big enough food source that's going to f- encourage them to go out of their way to go to it. That's what I was I was trying to think of because um, I think that so I it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to hold deer, you need a big food source. You need a big food source. You need a lot of things. You need a big food source. You need bedding. You need everything a deer needs to live for a lot of them to keep them there, which is not feasible for 90% of people probably. But I think to to draw them to you versus, uh, I mean, getting them to come over to something, I feel like a, a decent-sized food plot is pretty well needed. The only time I've used, or s- I didn't even get to use it because it got ruined, uh, was a, a smaller food plot was solely for the fact of I know these deer are coming through here already. I just want to try to get them to come over on the one trail I need them to more so um, and maybe hold up for a couple of minutes kind of thing because they're already coming through there, but it, there wasn't any great way for me to get them to funnel down through one right. or two different spots. Um, so that's just something I've kind of thought of because I feel like a lot of people think, oh, just put a food plot in. No matter how what the size is, it's going to make be a game changer. I just don't think that that's uh, – you got to have a lot of things in your favor for it to be a game changer if it's small. Um, that's, that, was, that was my question or why I asked that. I got one more, but I was going to kind of hang on to it till we because it's completely different from what we were just talking about. Okay. Did you have something you wanted to add? I got three. Let's do yours. Um. And it's very similar to, to your guys' except for one of them. Access for particular deer. So one thing that I learned with, I feel as though with BG this year, there was a, fortunately it didn't bite us, but I think it was going to be a huge mistake is I think I was going to be, and you for that matter, I think we were going to be really limited on the amount of times that we could hunt him because the access, the access sucked. You could not get into it without busting deer, and you could not get out of it without busting deer. And as we all know, you can only pressure deer so much before they don't tolerate that anymore. Um, and so then, so that brings you to the. I've thought about well, how, what could I have done different there? Sure, I could I could have looked at a few things a little bit differently as far as maybe I could have gone to the, you know, over to the west edge and then gone up to the north, which I don't know if that would have helped or anything either. But my point is, if I'd have been thinking about that a year before. I'd had more time to some of it. A lot of it's because, like, I was like, I, well, I don't know what walking through the timber is going to be like, I, and I don't want to go try and do that at five a.m. in the dark for the first time, dragging Eli behind me and seeing what's going to happen. Right. Um, so I could either, and then too, if I needed to, I could possibly cut cut lanes or give myself a path that I know I can get into that. Now, that, is that going to be a little bit difficult to you know that deer is there and and what he's doing? Yeah, but at the same time, like you said, a lot of the, the times they are doing these things that are pretty pretty similar to the previous years. That would be one thing I would add is, for me, I'm fortunate, and I don't know if there's, I'm sure there's a lot of other guys that probably have the same thing, but I have like a photographic deer memory. Like I can, you can almost, any deer that's somewhat noticeable, you can ask me which deer it was or whatever and where, and I can tell you last year roughly the time and where he was on what camera. And so I don't take notes really, and I probably should, but I usually can remember them, especially if it's one that I really like. Bullwinkle, I could almost tell, I could tell you every photo that we ever had of him off the top of my head, even before I killed him. Um, and I think that that information really, really helps you. So then my second one was also it was pinch points, but and I have a strategy on what I'm gonna do for this already, and this is gonna be so hard for me because it during shed season. I freaking love shed hunting, and then I get, like, really excited because I think that af- behind every tree is going to be that 80-inch antler I'm looking for. 
And so I don't really get all that concerned with the hunting and everything, but I'll see a big scrape or a bunch of rubs or stuff, and I'll mark it on Onyx. Is what I should have been doing the entire time is taking note of those things and then be really looking because this is when you're when your trails are the best, they're the most beat down, it's the best information that you can possibly have because all those rubs, all those scrapes, all that was happening during the rut during the or the pre-rut, during the times that you're going to be chasing those deer and trying to kill them. I should be taking that information, and then I should be, that's my problem, is I want to be looking for an antler. What I should be looking for is stand locations. Okay, there's a ditch that comes up here, and this ditch is almost impassable for x amount of distance or this or that and finding these things that i feel as though is going to force them through something um and then marking those i have and, a question and a, well, hold on a lot of times you'll see that in the winter like you're talking about that they're going around the ditch yes you know or they're on the ground yeah so. you'll be like holy cow look at what this is why they were doing this you yes know? so which i can think of the, one of the best examples of that is where we were trying to kill hammer it's a road and every flipping deer was using it. And the only reason we ended up figuring that out is because dad and I kept going by. And I was like, look at all these tracks. And he's like, I know, there's always they're always there. I'm like, well, let's put a camera on it. And we finally put a camera on it, and it was just loaded with deer. And they're just lazy bastards. They're just walking, walking the right road. down the road. And just and tons of and them were doing it. You go to some of your other spots, and they won't touch a road. Yeah, I don't or or they they won't walk up or down it. And what we They'll mean cross is like it. a two tr- like your four wheeler tracks. Or yeah, it wasn't like a paved road with cars yeah. going down it. Uh, <laughs> what are you highlighting though? Because here I feel like the trails may not be as beneficial as they seem, versus finding where there's uh, this year's rubs and scrapes. Um, the reason I'm saying that is because I feel like if you're just going off of trails um, in a lot of deer traffic especially during February, March, whenever you're going to be actually shed hunting, I feel like that could be much more prone to give you information on this time of year. I don't want to hunt anymore, meaning late season, that they're in here late season. Because I know there's some places we have that deer move more into a certain spot during late season. So are you focusing more on the trails? Are you focusing more on, okay, there's a massive scrape here and there's trails and there's rubs here or one or the other or what? Because I feel like you want to try to take the most knowledge of sign you can get that pertains to the rut or somewhere around the rut. I'm trying to take, I'm trying to find, first find a location that I know that there was a significant amount of deer activity. From that point, now is what I'm trying to do is find a, and this won't always be the case, but I'm going to, I'm going to try, I'm going to pay a lot more attention this year. I'm going to try and find a physical feature that naturally forces those deer to some extent because if let's just say if i have um you know a bedding area that's just getting hammered lots of scrapes rubs all that good stuff and then to the north is a big ditch right and then i can see that hey there's still sign here and then there's a big trail well they got to get into that bedding area somewhere and so is what i'm gonna say okay this for a west wind or whatever is great with this pinch point because they still got to get into that bedding area. Sure, they might come from the south, but then that's what I'm going to do on the south side too. I'm going to try and f- figure out, okay, we're on the south side. What gives me, I'm, I'm actually going to try to get away from the sign a little bit. If I can find a pinch point with the sign, great. But if I can find something that's on their path to somewhere, I'm more concerned about that because I think that is, I want to go see the deer, sure, and I want to be in the deer, but my main goal is I want to kill them. Yeah. And I think that by being in that pinch point, it keeps me from having these encounters as much where I'm seeing them at 60 yards or 80 yards or I can't get them to do anything. It's when he's going into that bedding area, I got your ass. Mm -hmm. That is what I'm going to be. And I can't say that that's going to work or not yet because I've never paid that much attention in detail when I'm shed hunting because I'm looking for an antler. And I know, and I've kicked myself several times because I've walked stuff. I'm like, and, and I've got a pin there. And I didn't mark, I didn't say anything. I didn't give myself a note. And I'm like, well, what the hell did I put this here for? Yeah. And But I know if I took the time to make a pin, like there it was, was something, something important. The sole yeah. purpose yes. why I got my own Onyx when I first got it. Because you tweaked me out with how unorganized your Onyx is. Well, I'm going to try to do a better job of organizing it. And then the third thing that I would say that I think uh, is a really interesting one is I'm going to expand my camera range. And I think you have a bad habit of this. We put our cameras in the same exact spots every single year. And 
what I've what we've all seen somewhat is we're having some deer like say swoops um, or bullwinkle. Uh, I'm sure there's others that as they got older, change their their areas kind of changed, and and you may not be that far off. Mini Mitch would be another one. Now he's a little different because he's over a mile, but uh, where he's at. He's there all the time. So a lot of these deer, and then we get one or two pictures of them casually roaming through, and we think, oh, okay, he's around somewhere, or or then we think he's dead. And a lot of them are dead. They're just, they've moved this range, and then their range doesn't seem to expand, and I agree with that because we were talking about it with swoops. I think that it's more of a, of a, a mating deal. Once they are four years old, five years old, they may not be there as much anymore because they're needing to find their own zone where they're able to go and breed does. And so I think I'm going to try to not get in the habit of keeping cameras in the same spots. Um, sure, I may always have them there if it's a good, reliable spot, but I'm going to also try to force myself to be trying other spots. And I think that um, eventually or, or maybe even every year, you're going to pick up a new deer or find that one spot that that other deer was. KB is another example of a deer that we used to, on this particular place, we get him pictures of him on the west side all the time. I could have killed him 10 times by the time he was four. By the time he was like five, you'd never, ever see him on, on that side of the farm, even during the rut, ever. And then, and it just casually kept getting smaller and smaller until he was very specific to a little, a little yeah, range. Yeah, yeah. Yep. 100%. That was yours? Yep. All right, I have, I kind of have two because one of them you guys won't agree or you won't do, and that is, it it came it really became obvious to me. We had two buddies that came out and hunted this year, the last week of October, first week of November, and they were from Pennsylvania. So they and they told me, "Hey, we're ready to sit all day," and I was like, "Okay." Honestly, sitting all day at that time of year probably wouldn't have done them any good, because what they were going through at that point was the does were starting to come into heat, and we were starting to see um, buck activity, buck big buck activity was with a doe that was it they're locked down big time what i noticed was the more and then i looked at trail cameras the more that i hunted longer mornings when i was trying to fill a second tag um, i'm sitting longer and i'm seeing way more deer movement later in the season 10 o'clock to two o'clock late, late and what i mean like i'm talking like where you got into like thanksgiving and beyond and I believe that they, those bucks are running out of does. And it takes that long here. So that would adjust someone's time depending on how many deer you have in your area and that kind of thing. But for us, we have enough does that it held them for a while. until. Be, but then it was like 11 o'clock in the morning, 1 o'clock in the morning on some of our food plots, I would have a deer come in the afternoon. In the afternoon. Do you think that those were um, local deer that – were around at 7, 8, 9 a.m. and then got up and were traveling? Or do you think that the, those deer were on a mission? And so they'd been walking all morning trying to I find think, a doe, and, and they're, they're just going all day. They're, they're looking. They're, yeah. They're going all day at that point. Right. You know, um, so I definitely think that there is something to be said for all-day sits or, or not being afraid to go climb in a stand at 9 o'clock yeah. in the morning. I mean, you go just – you, you think, oh, I can't go hunting this morning. I have to go do whatever it is. You have kids, you have a dog, you have whatever. But you could go climb in a stand at 9 o'clock. You almost killed a really big deer by climbing in a stand at like 1, 12 or 1. Me, me and you, when uh, Dagger, that was oh, at yeah. like 2.30 or 3 o'clock. Frayne was before that. Yeah, so, yeah, I, mean, but, I mean, my point is, is that those deer are moving. At mm -hmm. that it more, not that they're not moving earlier, like in October and November, but it seems like there's even more movement later on. When and I, and the thing I can attribute that to is that there's less does for them to pick from. Right. You know, so they have to to try to find they, that exactly. Yeah. Yep. So um, that would be one of the big ones was adjusting all day sits, and then the other one, and I know that Nick is not going to like this one. I hate when he hears me say this is. <laughs> I killed my deer this year because me and you went and moved a stand. And we put that stand in, and then I went back the next day, climbed in that stand, and shot my deer. 
saddle hunting is giving you that opportunity to do that all the time. So next year, I will employ saddle hunting more. Um, I will make Ooh, I will make sure whoa. that I, I will make sure that I have the ability to p- go into somewhere be fairly new. Um, I, I love hunting the stand for the first time. I I know that you don't, and and I believe that they just you catch them off guard. You know, yeah. the first time that you're in that stand, they don't know what's going on. They're not, they're susceptible to. Well, I don't didn't see that here yesterday. Those two big lumps in that tree, but maybe it's okay for now. Where if you hunt it two or three, four times, or two years, or three years, then they start. They've seen it. They know what's up. Yeah, yeah. you. Get, I mean, this one's a perfect example. He looked at you guys directly in that tree. Yeah, yeah. Easton's deer we killed out of a saddle because I I went to go put some batteries back in a camera and busted a whole bunch of deer and saw one big deer which I believe was Easton's and and. He ran into the timber, but he out, he didn't run like he was terrified. So I was told him, I'm pretty sure that deer, I don't think he's going to go that far. Like, I think he's close. And Easton and I went and got in saddles and set up that afternoon. And uh, we had, we had like, 10 does come by, and the, that was what was wonderful about it. They never even Love glanced that. at us, never even looked over, nothing. And then his buck looked right at us, but – didn't seem to care, and I think, I don't know, maybe because it, you know, it was a brand new spot, and he was just like, oh, it's just a big limb, um, and kept coming, and then Easton was at full draw on him, and, and he was looking at us again, but obviously it didn't matter, and I think, I I still think he would have just kept going as long as we didn't move like we were doing, um, but yeah, I think, I also think that your idea is good of, if you have the ability to have some preset saddle locations, because I know I hear all these guys talking about, oh, I need to, it's got to be the most quiet stuff and everything else. I'm like, if you start doing some saddle hunting at any, to any amount, and maybe, maybe I'm just a clunky sucker and there's, and everybody else is like a damn ninja. Stealth. You can't be that quiet. I don't care what your gear is. I don't care what the deal is. You got to put the sticks on the tree. And when they, when you're doing that, it makes some noise. You got, you got platform enough stuff to do that. You, you are hanging a set essentially, and I guess for one person it's probably a lot different. Right. But for us, with with two people, I mean, like that's what I told Easton when we were going, and I know it was hard for him because I'd, I'd just tell him we're better off just getting set up and and getting our stuff ready quicker than taking forever and trying to be super quiet. And that's the other thing too. People I think need to keep in mind is deer's hearing is only about as good as a human's, and so that I mean they really got it unless you're making tons of noise. They got to be within 70, 80 yards of you to hear you if yeah. you're not being ridiculously loud. But we did it on purposely on him. <clears throat> we knew where we were going that there's a good chance there's some deer really close. And we said, let's just get in there quietly. And then I'll, we're early, so I'm just going to take my time setting up. And I'm going to take my time setting up quietly because it was, and sure enough, probably a good thing that we did because the moment I stepped into my platform, I was tied in, but I hadn't even gotten any, like my pack off or anything and two bucks came under as a 15 yards. Yep. So how, how are you going to employ this? What do you mean? What, what is this going to look like for you? Meaning that is it bedding areas? Is it food sources? Is it just changing it up sometimes or I what? I think just changing it up sometimes. I think we have some stands that we need to move. Yeah. You know, that they're just worn out. You yep. know, they've been there long enough and, um, so it's time to move some of them, and and that will be part of it. Not 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 necessarily needing the saddle, but move the tree, and maybe in some locations it might be only a ten yard move. You know, other places maybe it's pull that stand completely out and move to a different segment of the trail that you're hunting or the food food plot or whatever. Um, and that means that also taking ground blinds and putting ground blinds in different locations. Yeah, you know. Um, not we're not getting busted out of our ground blinds. That's the thing is because the pallets, I believe, make it where I can just go drop it in there and you're good. Well, just, it's way harder to see in there too. Yeah. Yep. So, but anyhow, so those are my that that was my adjust my all day sits and employ the saddle and then pay more attention to food. Even even during the rut, the food is still a, a huge um, factor factor or draw or it might even still be because the, the again it becomes where the deer are where the deer are and where the does are at different times um 
You know, I mean, it just like he was with Easton's deer was with a bunch of different other deer, you know? Um, and then when we were hunting, uh, yeah, last, no, last year, and those deer were coming out to a food source, you know, and it was a late season type thing, you know? So it's just being able to get close to food is a, is a huge one, especially as the season drags on, it becomes yep. more and more prevalent. Yep. Anything else? It's time for the best part of the oh, entire boy, the best podcast. Part. Best part. Of, I don't know if it's the best part of the po- podcast, but it's the part of the podcast. So, all right. So it, we're going to do Warren's Wacky Facts, which I'm introducing because he can't even remember what it's called half the time. Go ahead. Let's see, let's hear yours and see if you can compete I, with the master. I was trying to be nice, and I picked up on a tip that someone sent, and I saw it the other day. And I thought, I told Warren, I was like, hey, I have a wacky fact for you that you could use. And he doesn't want it. He was like, you just say it. And he's going to be mad because mine is really, really good. Do you know what animal, what mammal does not stand with his butt into the storm, but instead turns and faces the storm and walks into it intentionally? A buffalo. Buffalo does that. Why? Why? Because they're going to get through the storm instead they, of waiting it out. They know that they can make it through. You guys read the thing that mom. I was going to say I, Gerard, Gerard Butler, Gerald Butler. I did, what a guy from Three Hundred. <laughs> he faces the damn storm. Did mom send us something with that? I, I, that's where I saw it. Is that one of her sisters or whatever sent some a picture of this buffalo covered in ice and? and I'm glad I didn't his take face that was. one. But, yeah, they walk into the storm agree, because they I'm know hard, they can get through the storm faster by facing it and walking to it. Give you guys, I'm a pretty hard judge, but here is a good one. You could have done better. Whatever. A woodpecker has its tongue wrapped around its brain in order to protect its, he- its brain from high-speed pecking. That is the best one you've come up with That yet. is a wacky fact. <laughs> what in the world? How do they get their <laughs> tongue back there? I don't know. It says, because <laughs> I saw that it makes somewhere. makes total sense. And too. then I had to, to check it. It says, yes, having its tongue wrapped around the back of its brain doesn't just give a woodpecker somewhere to store a long appendage. It also helps protect the bird's brain from injury during high-speed pecking. I figured and it wraps had a all the of- way around it. Yeah, that's gnarly. I figured I they just a, had a bunch of juice in there protecting it or something. I have a whole new appreciation <laughs> for woodpeckers next time I see one because they have such a long tongue. Yeah, well, and it, to wrap around their brain. All right, it's that's crazy. Odd, but yeah. All right, so we have filled your guys' heads full of knowledge. Not, I don't know what and you would tongues, call that, huh? And tongues. <laughs> um, so thank you guys for tuning in and joining us. Oh, man, hold on. Can't do it. I promised him that we would talk about it. Logan Matson. Okay. He, he, we'll save it, though, because I think it's a part of a topic of its own, and that is he wanted to know how can you he, – he's heard us, he's watched the podcast, and that we are reading deer is what he's referring to, and he was asking how do you read a deer? Can you go into detail on that? I would think that's an entire podcast. I, yeah, I, I do, too. That's so. Yeah. Uh, well, so Logan, sorry, man, we got wrapped up in the one we were doing, but we'll get to it at some point. I didn't want want to shoot you an answer because I felt like it was too good a topic that we could maybe do, do it next week. Yep. So, anyhow, so we are going to get out of here. Thank you guys for joining us, and we appreciate you. For those of you that have still not filled a tag, or maybe you already have, and you got another season coming. Good luck. Um, we have another season that comes in after our shotgun season, so. We'll we can pick our bows back up or our muzzle loaders and go out and chase them some more. All right.